Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to episode six. Six. We yes, are here. We are here. Six. I am life coach Eric Cole. And I am psychotherapist Tony Purnell. Yes. And we are your favorite happy hour your duo. Your favorite happy hour duo. Yes, yes. Welcome to another week, another episode of Hung Up Hot Live. It feels good to be in the building. And thank y'all. With my people. For supporting us Everybody yet again. that's here, thank you. We got our audience here. We have some guests in the audience. Shout out to Trey. Trey Real. Trey Way, what's up? What's up? Philly's finest. Literally. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> Philly's finest. <laughs> All right. Now I don't want y'all. He, pull, me. he rolling up on curves on people. I'm telling you. Like. Don't be DMing me after the episode. <laughs> well, who was that? Because you know that's that's how it was with the producers. They wanted to know who they were. They always do. But yeah, he, no. He's he's public. His profile is not <laughs> private. Oh, so. oh, oh, hold on, on. You made it private. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> but you can still follow me. <laughs> All right. Go. There we go. How you doing? I am good. Um, shout out to Roger, my homeboy. He came into town last night from Florida, mm-hmm. and he wanted to hang out and go get a drink. So where do you think we ended up? Um, Philly's Gay Black Bar. <laughs> <laughs> Is that where you at? Mm-hmm. The, the level the level up? Yeah. Okay, yeah. But, you know, because I'm not I'm not frequent there, I didn't know what we were in for. Me and Roger just When was, was this, like, last night? Yeah. Oh, oh stripper night. Listen, mm, mm-hmm. me and Roger was like on some cool shit. Like, yo, we just going to get a drink. And I was like, cool, that works because <laughs> I have to be up early. Production, we got shit to do. So it was like, all right, let's just go to the, you know, go to the bar real quick. You know, first of all, the $20 cover. <laughs> I yeah, was like, okay, see, so I'm done. Going on I don't tonight. do covers. I don't do covers. I'm, I'm sorry. That's it's, why I stopped going on Thursdays. It's a, it's a little bit of a gag. I mean, but, but you I had a good time. I understand, you know, people got to make money. Yeah, rent rent has to true. be paid. Security has to be paid. Bar t- you know, I, I get it. Um. But yeah, it was a lot. You know, it was a lot of dick swingings. Oh, oh Lord, like Lord. hard. Like I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> Yo, I'm impressed that these dancers can like they keep their dick that hard that long. Well, you know that's what that little elastic band is for. Oh, you know? it did to keep that blood. Yeah, I know band. a little song. You know. Yo. <laughs> I oh. mean, that's not my lifestyle. But I'm just saying. You know, I just know a little. I know, I know the mechanics of behind the scenes. But we gonna, uh, um, we gonna get into more. You we know, get a little bit la- more. later. Well, um, how are you? <laughs> I am well. I went on a um, immersive experience last night. We went to a fright house or a haunted experience. Come on, for it, the it was like a, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was like a haunted hayride and like, like several other attractions. So we how had was fun. It? It, was, it was fun. It was, was it fun. Spooky? It was fun. It was scary a little bit. Did you scream? I did. I screamed a lot. You, <laughs> I screamed a lot. Um, okay, so you got your money's worth. I got my money's worth. So I was spend some good time with some friends, and yeah, that's what it's about. Yeah. And we get to like continue some of that later today. Oh we yes, go we're going to a pumpkin, pumpkin patch. Yeah, this is going to be fun. We're going to do some little Halloween, autumn, fall stuff. So yeah, yeah let's yeah. go. So let's excited go. about that! Absolutely. Yes. Um, we are going to go into our next segment: our hung up, hang up. Y'all know what time it is. Let's go. Do we need to like let the people know? Remind them. I think we should because people keep they don't really know what still don't know what the hung up hang up is. Some people go ahead and break it down, Tony. So listen, if I'm hung up on something, I just can't let it go. I'm at the top tier. Like I cannot let this thing go. I am hung up. I just want to stay up here. It's high. I am a vibe. I am living on thing. I am hung up. Yes. And now what is hanging it up? Let 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 the folks know. I mean that was the gentle hang up, but sometimes it's. <laughs> Honestly, and that's why we miss a lot of people miss the flip phones because you know when you hung up on somebody, bam! Hold on, like, le- listen. You, you know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like the same thing. Like you hanging up, you're done. It's you're like bitch, over it. I'm hanging the fuck up on this topic on this episode. Absolutely. We yeah, hanging up. We hanging up. And so if y'all didn't get it, then I don't know if we gonna. I don't know what it's gonna take for y'all to get the hung up, hang up. They gonna get it. They gonna get it. Okay. We just gotta be patient with the people. All right. Well, let's 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 make sure they got it this time around. <laughs> so let's start out this segment this game of hung up hang up what you got for us this time is it on me i'll go i'll pick it out i'll all pick right, it out right. i'll pick it out oh this oh, dating someone with kids am i hung up or i'm are you hung up or, or hanging up or am i hanging up you know what i don't know this this, this should be a whole episode it really can't um be. dating someone with kids listen oh i've been okay I'm, I'm gonna be honest I'm hanging up. I'm going to just hang up. You're hanging up? I'm hanging up. No, no, because let me tell you something. Right now, I'm in my selfish years, and I want to travel. I want to do things with me and or my partner, and I I don't want to have any. Oh, you looking like what? You don't agree? 
No. Oh, I'm like, what? Shit, that's, no, I'm, 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 I, like I said, I'm hanging up. Like I said, no, I don't need no barriers to get where I want to be with my man and myself. Mm -mm, them kids, fuck them kids. <laughs> okay, fuck them kids. I'm sorry, no. Oh, yeah. Like I said, okay, what about you? <laughs> I don't know. I've been there, and I just feel like it was an appropriate question because I just feel like, especially being, you know, men of a certain age, well, I when you're out yet. here dating, you know what I'm saying, you you are likely to run into some people with kids, and I think that's on both sides, not just the gay side. I think on the straight side too. Like mm. you, once you get to a certain age level or you know a dating range, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Like I a lot agree. of people be having kids. I agree. You know what I mean. So I don't know. I, I'm sort of. I guess I'm hanging up because I'm just not. I'm not ready yet. See now, he, you know, I did all that. <laughs> you know, and he gonna hang up anyway. It's you hard know? for me because like someone I dated with kids was oof. Mm, he was okay. special. Like you said, he was hanging special. up, and I get it. I get it. Mm. What's the next one, baby? God bless the children. God bless the child. Shitty kitty in the club. Oh Lord, Lord, Lord. <laughs> Did you see the videos? Um, all the all the tweets going viral this past few weeks. People were talking about you know taking shits in the club. How how dare you take a shit in the club and then then go back out on the dance floor and throw that thing in a circle? <laughs> <I can't. laughs> the people want to know. I how can't. dare you? Wait, what's wrong with that? Like I'm I'm gonna Ooh, tell you, I ain't you got. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. I don't think I I don't think I ever had ever had to take a shit in the club, <laughs> but. <laughs> You said like wait first. Let me just be honest. But I don't think I have ever had to. Had to um, yeah, I've never. Because, really but if if I needed if to, it, it would have to be a, an emergency. I'm gonna fucking go. <laughs> I can't be having then, stomach issues if I'm trying to. <laughs> I can't. I can't have that. Absolutely not. I think I never had to go because I usually like take care of that before I head out. Yeah, but if I had to, mm -mm, nope. I'm a lot, a lot of that prep do. does, I feel like, for me, happen at the house. Like, shower, mm -hmm. poop, shower, you know? do what you need to do, get the outfit. You know what I'm saying? You're getting fresh and all that. Mm -mm. Um, if you at the club doing it, I think something went wrong. Something went terribly wrong. But, um... <laughs> Wait, they should be stopping Wait, you? We got an audience member. He said, we're your friends. They should no, be coaching if you. Gonna, if you're going to do that, then really... Ooh! Because you're, ooh, you're ooh. not throwing that thing in a circle after that. <laughs> What? That is so crazy. Well, oh maybe my God. maybe maybe the girls got to be prepared and bring like baby wives and you know, or or just don't fucking do it. You know that enough. That enough. You need a bidet, okay? That bathroom go, do be funky. Go to in my the club, bathroom. Though. Get get on my toilet. Get on the bidet. But we know that bathroom do be funky at the club though, because y'all be shitting. <laughs> Our next hung up hang up is Coach Stormy and low vibrations. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I got my whole life. With this Coach Stormy stuff and these little <laughs> vibrational plates, you I, 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 I just—it was a whole key. I loved it. I was like, first of all, I was like, who is she? Where is all this coming from? And I had to do some research. She is a master life coach. Yes, she is. And she has and a I following. love her. She, yeah, she's out here. But how do you feel about this low vibrational plate? I man, it. You think she was wrong? Absolutely not. Cause that she was giving spirit of Tony. You know, I was after I, I saw me and her. I said, oh, that's something I would have said. That's something I would have did. Like, really? Yeah, absolutely. If somebody sat down with you, sat down next to you, and they plate was just. You, you have some class. Have some decorum. Okay? Come on now. Go back if you want more. Like, no, stop. Stop. It was no. low vibrations If you, you want more, go get more when, you, when you're ready. You, that was a scarcity mindset. Oh, I got to eat it all right now because I don't know. And that's, I'm, getting, I'm, getting a little, I'm getting a little clinical, you know, back into my mindset. Sometimes we we had this mindset, I got to eat everything now. I got to pile on my plate. People who came out of prison, I, my mother, <laughs> she does that. I have cu I have eat, cussed out my mom for doing it. Exactly. She I've eats so fast, that. have everything on her plate. Mom, there's plenty over here. Go go get more when you're done. You so it. I knew exactly what she Come was Come on, queen about. behavior. And Let's get it together. I'm hung up. You Stormy, hung up do, it, do it again. Stormy. Do it again, Stormy. Yeah, I didn't post the... Everyone was reposting when Funky Dineva was, like, reading her down. I didn't repost that, but I reposted when she kind of doubled down mm -hmm. on what she was saying. Look, I mean, life coaches, they all got different styles. Mm -hmm. um, I've told people, stop clanking on them plates when they eat, and I cannot stand when people... The clank, 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 clank with the silverware in the bowl or on the fork on the plate like stop I, I cannot stand shit like that yeah. so it's just like wow i wasn't really with the low vibrational shit it was just like at the end of the day like i can kind of almost understand 
the the foolishness. Yeah. I'm super excited. You yeah. know, yeah. like we had we interviewed Miss Lanette Cookie Williams. Your girl. My girl. Like that's she is a friend of mine. Yeah, y'all have a of great the relationship. Hit show American Gangsters B E T on B E T plus American Gangsters Trap yeah. Queens. Yeah. And so we spoke to the real estate mogul yeah. um, and how she came from a life of luxury, her empire that she built, and how the empire came crashing down. It really did. Because of the decisions. Yeah. And you the know? bubble burst. And the bubble burst, you know. We talk about real and estate. President Obama's uh, task force, because that's what really did it. You know. <laughs> okay. We're gonna get, y'all going to see when we, when we interview her. We, we y'all gonna see right. when we interview you know Cookie about her experience. Um, this this episode is really about relationships. Yes, right. Yeah, because we we talked a lot about her upbringing, Queens, mm-hmm. what it was like for her, the up, second black family on the block, which where she came from, two parent household, mm-hmm. all of those good things, two sons, raising two sons, having to be a single mom, having to figure it out. Going through what she went through, but what was that like for her on the inside? Exactly. You know what I'm saying? She had 10 years. 10 years on the inside. And what did that do to her relationships with her kids? And then, like, what was that transition out, coming out? Yeah. Especially with her nonprofit organization where she's working with other women who are transitioning out of the system. So. I, look, we, we all got a little teary eyed a few times during the interview. You actually cried when you watched the actual episode. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, cause I didn't see a criminal. I just saw, I saw a person. Oh, she was a criminal. She, she did. What she Millions. Did, but a lot of people do things and just don't get caught. That's what she said. That's what she said actually in the yeah. episode. Yeah. You know, I mean, What was know? that our producer? Oh, you know, right. We talked about that a little bit during the interview yeah. too. It's just like, it was so easy for them to crack down on the little man mm-hmm. and make an example out of the little man where the big banks, the corporate, the people who wear, you know, the, what do you call them? The white collar. Mm-hmm, yeah. They don't suffer. They don't, they don't have to pay any consequences. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for all y'all to see and uh, yes. witness and hear her journey yeah. um, and interview by us. This is our first official guest on the Hung Up Pod Live yes. team. And, we are hoping you will enjoy it. And so we're going to go right to that video. Yeah. And we will talk about our um, experiences afterwards. Absolutely. So check out this video that we have with Lynette Cookie Williams. Enjoy. Cookie, you are our official this first guest, massive. baby. Yes, this is massive. <laughs> you, you popping the hung up cherry, girl. <laughs> hey, wow. Pop that thing. Pop that thing. Awesome. Um, we are going to, um, we're going to get right into it. I'm, um, we're going to start out by reading your bio. Um, and we're going to ask you some questions. Um, like I said, we are a culture and society podcast um, focusing on a Black queer perspective. Um, but we thought your story, your journey was so significant that we, we related to it significantly. With your mother, Eric's mother, my mom, our relationships, um, we wanted to hear more about your story and your perspective, and we know the world needs to hear more. Um, a inside perspective with Hung Up Live, Eric and Tony. Okay, um, and so Tony is telling the truth because Tony wasn't I in tears the first time I watched that episode. Like I was in tears, was over. and we'll get into it. We'll get into it. Yeah. yeah. All right, Miss <clears throat> Lynette Cookie Williams. She is the founder and the CEO a woman unsilenced and she's a public figure. She's a star, the hit show star, BT Plus American Gangster Trap Queens. And she's a certified master life coach and her niche is entrepreneurship with mental health first aid. Cookie Williams has a journey and it has been marked by triumph and challenges and victories. Her life is pillared by accomplishments via Trek as a successful founder and serial entrepreneur, which culminated in an eight-figure real estate empire. Today, with the establishment of Woman on Silence and her podcast, The Sisteration Room, Ms. Williams provides a judgment-free platform, bridging the gap between society and returning citizens. The Sisteration Room is where the conversation happens, where the returning citizens will find understanding listeners and receive help navigating their way toward living a life of purpose. Ms. Williams continues to elevate her work fighting recidivism, homelessness for returning citizens, especially women 
which increases her impact in the area of women's empowerment. She's a certified master life coach with her niche in entrepreneurship, as I said before, and includes five levels of transformor transformative development. In addition, she is a certified mental health first aid from the National Council of Mental Wellbeing. This single mother's guilty plea to white collar charges of fraud in, two, in 2012, to which she was sentenced and served a 10 year federal sentence, was made clear a straight path for the nonprofit journey that awaits her nurturing. She has a natural gift that allows her to connect and impact those all around her. It is a gift she uses every day to bridge the gap between society and our returning trauma impacted women and their families. Since her return to society, Cookie has obtained fellowships with various nonprofit organizations, including Fortune Society and Our Children, both highly credible organizations. Most recently, Ms. Williams is a recipient of the Justice and Scholar Fellowship at the Columbia University and the star of the American Gangster Trap Queens on BT Plus Network. Cookie, as she is affectionately known, has received many written testimonials and accolades of appreciation from her treasure trove of peers, colleagues, and associates that allows her to draw, to draw on her experience and expertise as she continues to win. In one word, she says, resilience. Come on. That's resilience. A powerful bio. I love that. Hello. And welcome to the Hunger Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. What did, well, that was awesome. <laughs> Listen, that that's you. <laughs> that is you. <laughs> it's all you. Our first guest. This is exciting. Well, for, congratulations, you guys. This is this is awesome. You know, when we can when we can take what is given to us or what's provided and use it for um, just use it for progressiveness and for productivity yeah. and for us. It just yeah. it just makes yeah. a world of difference. It's, we sure know how to get in there and just make things happen with what we have, right? Absolutely. Okay. And sometimes what we have is not much, you know, and we can still, like you said, find a way to turn it into a treasure. Mm -hmm. That's it's, right. Yeah. That's right. That's I, right. I, 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 re I really don't get nervous, but I don't know. I'm a little, you a little nervous. nervous. <laughs> It's a star in the building. I'm always on the other side when I speak the cookie now. I'm like, I'm, I'm like, it's a star in the building. Tony, yeah. you do my show with me. That's oh, what I'm, I'm saying. I'm a little nervous <laughs> on this side. I think, Talk about I that, think, Tony, your relationship um, that you already have with Miss Cookie. Like I said, you know, you know, we work together every last Thursday of the month. Um, and we do an addition. Uh, um, we do a LGBTQ addition um, yeah. episode. Um, and it is called. It is called. In fact, let me help you about that with that tone. <laughs> so every last Thursday on um, in the Sisteration Room, we address issues of the LGBTQIA plus mm -hmm. community, um, and that stems largely because of my uh, journey along my journey of incarceration. I just I, I witnessed a lot um, of unjust and mm -hmm. and. Yeah. Um, and the differences that were made between, you know, the LGBTQ community and the straight community. Um, so I wanted to address that and not for nothing else. I mean, the journey that I was on was a little different than how men experience it in, in, in their communities, but I'm about inclusion. That's, Absolutely. that's just me. You know, if I had <clears throat> a bilingual assistant Trust me, she would be on here so we can speak to the Spanish speaking community as well. Mm -hmm. I know so, right. because we are all, we are all marginalized, you know, yeah. and, we, and we have to come together at some point. So I love when we talk about the black and brown community. We talk That's about right. all communi communities, I know I do, but especially the black and brown community because our, our, our shortcomings um, in, how we what we were given to start out in life with are different yeah yeah yes yes absolutely and so in that addition the lgbtq addition you know spotlight it's more coming from a clinical perspective you know um as a professional and as an expert in that area you know i shine you know my light is on with the clinical eye 
and talk about, you know, the people who've come on the show with her um, and then my expertise in that area. Yes. And that's why I'm yes. there every last Thursday of the month in the situation room. Yes. Um, but yeah. we want to get down to the nitty gritty. All right. We want to know <laughs> how you got here. You know, tell us a little about who you are outside of your bio, how you got here, who you are as a woman, as a mother, as a person in this community. Well, in, in short, I am a kind, nurturing, loving individual that, like most of us, um, has her guards up, sets boundaries, and uh, but always open with an ear and a heart. Mm -hmm. That's basically, that's, that's me outside of my bio. Okay. My, my bio did speak volumes because the, because the work that is on, that, that you read about on my bio is, is my work on purpose. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. me, it is me, totally me living my life on purpose. Yeah. And, and so I do embody my bio 100%. I love mm -hmm. that because the wor words, they're on paper, but that that is powerful. And those are things that can live on forever. So I, I love that you're so passionate about that and you take it so seriously. Yeah. yeah. So Tony, if you don't mind, I, I kind of want to go back to Queens. I, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was a minute ago. Okay. She's like, wait, you want to go? That's talk yeah, about that foundation. Go. Beautiful life. She, it, had she did. Girl group she did. Up and, I mean, she was really doing her thing. I think that that's what made her experience even more pivotal, you know, to you know the crime that she committed, and then um, a life after prison. You know, she wasn't one. People keep talking about, you know, from the dirt. I had this, and you know, she she had a you know a really uh, um, a fairly good life, you know, even as a child. Yep. You know, they had two parent household, two cars, and you know. Back then, it was awesome. Yeah, she said she didn't know what it was like for her neighbor to not have a dad. Exactly. There, she said there was no people hanging out on the block. Like, mm -hmm. it was a lot of things that she just wasn't exposed to. Um, and that's how I felt. Like So even then, that sense of community. Even yeah. then, that sense of family. You know, she had that. Absolutely. That 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 is the foundation. And I, I one thing that stood out when I saw your premiere, BET Trap Queens, I remember one of the first things you said was you were the second black family that lived in your neighborhood. And so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what was that like growing up for you? What was that experience like? Let's talk about that because that is the end of the, the great migration. That right. period, that time period, we moved there in 1973. And y'all know my age, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> but we moved there in 1973. Of course, that's how documented uh, the end of the, the Great Migration. Uh, what is the sister's name that wrote that book, The Warmth of All Sons? Oh, my Lord, that book. I'm like, write that, that book. one down. Yeah, yeah, The Warmth of All Sons. Her name is uh, Wilkerson. And she was actually a first, the first Black woman um, Pulitzer Prize winner. She wrote that book. And um, I was like, wow. It was a pivotal time. Not only did I sense it and I witnessed it, but it's documented. It, it was a pivotal time in, in, in society in America. So um, it was, it was, let me tell you something. I'm gonna tell you how it was. You know, being the second, it was the second, we were the second black family on my block in Cambria Heights. And, um, and that whole neighborhood was pretty much like that one black family or two black families, maybe, maybe three somewhere in there somewhere. But um, it was it was interesting because we had moved there from the Bronx. So the Bronx was at that point in time, Soundview was a housing development, it was brand new. And um, so when we moved to Queens, it was a residential community. And so there were the white people in my life, right. for basically the first time that I would know you know, and, um, and slowly, not, uh, no, not even slowly, surely the vast exit happened. The exodus, I mean, <laughs> the, listen, when I tell you, those white people were gone by the end of the year. Well, we wow. moved there, we moved there in December. 
And it was like, you know, and I was a child at the time. So, you know, my parents were still taking us back and forth to school in, um, in the Bronx because we went to a private school in the Bronx, my brother and I. And she's like, well, not, by the time I turned around, it was, um, it was, it was just, it was a black neighborhood but it was one of your black neighborhoods that was filled with doctors and lawyers. And mm, it was mm -hmm. like, it was a time where middle-class actually existed for us as a people. Wow. And so it was a beautiful space to grow up in. It was a, the, the block, the people, if, 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 if um, somebody's parent was outside when the lights were off, when the lights went off, uh, when the lights came on, we could yeah. stay outside because that one mm -hmm. parent, mm -hmm. doesn't matter who it was, that one parent had all of us covered. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, that's the village, Those days right? are so far gone. Yeah. They are yeah. gone. And that, that, gone. that represents the idea of community, even mm -hmm. back then. Even so, well, I mean, go here. Do you feel like the other people in that community viewed you guys with a sense of privilege? Do you feel like you had, as the, the Black family, do you look like the other people of YouTube that have had privilege? Do I'm sorry, say that again. Do we look like the other people that have privilege? Do you feel like the other families in that community viewed you and your household oh. as having a little bit of privilege? Well, all the families that surrounded me had the same privilege. We mm -hmm. had we had two parent households. Everybody had a car. Sometimes there were two cars. There was two cars in my family. Mm -hmm. Parents worked, so everybody looked like me. Basically, okay. we it was it was that I grew up around that, not knowing, yeah. you know, um, really not even understanding and and knowing that the poverty was real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, if, if that's fair, you know, I didn't yeah. walk. I didn't. Get, I didn't walk out of my house and see. Um, a, a, my neighbor, you know, without a parent. I didn't see that. Mm -hmm, there was mm -hmm. nobody hanging out on my block, you know, not in my neighborhood. There was no hanging out in my neighborhood. Cambria Heights, whoop, whoop. Okay, <laughs> just for the record. <laughs> All right. So oh, it, was, right. It, was, it was that neighborhood. It was really that neighborhood, yeah. How many siblings? One. Okay. One so brother. you and your sibling, one brother, two parents. Yeah. And you had a group. You were charging <laughs> folks a quarter. See, the thing about it is the people the Not people the will folks. know. The sunshine. What was we it called? The sunshine group? We were char you would guess it was the sunshine group and we were charging the parents a quarter. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. And before we get to the sunshine group, I just want to say about my childhood in, in yeah. Queens during that time. Now, all of those things being said in my white picket fence exterior and everything, that does not mean that my life was perfect inside. Just That's like, what I was getting at as far as that privilege question. That's what I was tapping oh, into. Okay, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it doesn't mean my life was perfect inside, but I do want to say that you know, um, you know, our parents raise us, right? Our parents yeah. or our parents raise us um, for the most part, you know, God bless the ones that didn't have any parent. But um, so for the most part, our parents raise us. And so what we know is all we, is all we were taught from our parents, but we don't know that a lot of those teachings were based on what they grew up with. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So we are completely as a people unaware that we live generational trauma, damaging yes. generational trauma. Most of our community walks around with generational trauma untreated. And so Absolutely. and so the hostility and so the lack of a reason to smile, you know, yes. mm -hmm. so that's why I, I think just, it's more important to have this conversation about the whole being trauma informed instead of trauma impacting. You know, mm. a lot of the times because we are impacting mm, trauma, like we don't ever realize it. I'm serious, we don't realize that because of the culture we grew up in, sometimes shit is just passed down from yeah. culture to culture and you're still impacting trauma instead of being mm -hmm. in, a, in, in a formative measure. Does that, does that make sense? Am, am I talking okay, Eric? Is that all right? <laughs> It does make oh, sense. Oh, and, okay. and shout out and blessings to all the people who are breaking those, doing the work to break that trauma and those generational curses because yes. that is the right. thing where's the crown. It is very difficult to be in that position 
Um, you get a lot of uh, pushback from family members. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, you could find yourself feeling unsupported, even though mm -hmm. the support can be there in you know yeah. sometimes non-conventional ways, but it's there. But we oftentimes still feel lonely, you know. That is true. Mm -hmm. So I, I hear you loud and clear. Yeah, and the loneliness I think comes from you know the the the, the boundaries that we put up. Um, I, I think I, what I'll say boundaries are something that you actually put up. Let's just say a lot of us are lonely because of our um, our fear of sharing. Right. Yes, absolutely. So right here. So when we were talking about the aspect of trauma, this thing hit me so hard when she said every parent has the capacity to inflict trauma. When she said that, I was like, oh, my God, yeah. whether intentionally or not. Yeah. Her relationship with her mother, she really didn't have a good relationship with her mother. And then as a result, her relationship with her child, her children, because of decisions she made. Every parent has the capacity to inflict trauma intentionally or not. What happens in our household stays in this house. Uh, the things secrets. that we don't discuss, the secrets. Yeah. That thing, I was like, woo. And y'all going to see more of it. And y'all going to see when we get into that discussion with her even more. Emphasis on where you said unintentionally. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of times generational trauma is passed down exactly. from our parents. Our parents do the best that they can mm -hmm. most times than not. And... Some of that is learned behavior, what their exactly. parents did or what their parents didn't do exactly. or what they didn't get when they was growing up. And parents seem to pass that down. But it's time for, I think, us to want better for our kids. Absolutely. And I'm not saying that there aren't parents out there that aren't already on that frame of thinking, but I think just more of us need to get on board with yeah. that. Absolutely. And I honestly think because she said, you know, as a result of her own trauma that was inflicted, you know, she's an advocate for mental health now. Yeah. Um, Cookie is also, you know, she's a, a, a life coach. She's a certified life coach as well. Yeah. Like you, you know, and so her being an advocate for mental health because of her own experiences. Kudos to you. Yes. That's it. The we vulnerability or the lack of vulnerability. Of that, all of that. And we were taught not to share. What happens in this, in this house stays, house, in, this stays house. in this house. That's right. But how come we all know that? From your generation to Eric's to mine, how come we all know that? That that's a damn shame. Like like Cookie said, and it was passed down to us. We were it told was, that. It was passed down and I passed it down. I'm guilty as well. I'm guilty as well. You know, my life, life for me is about checking myself and it's about healing, you yeah. know? So I can yeah. say that. I said the same thing to my children. What goes yeah. on in this house stays in this house. Well, it wasn't nothing crazy going on in the house, but you right. know, but it doesn't matter because I think every parent has the capacity to 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 inflict trauma on our children. Oh yeah, oh definitely. And and, and not not intentionally, but unintentionally, exactly. you know. And um and so therefore, I'm such an advocate for therapy. It has changed my life for sure. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> changes mine regularly. <laughs> yes. So you're in treatment? Continually. You're in, oh, you're yeah. in active treatment? Oh, Absolutely. That's beautiful. Absolutely. Especially um, since returning. You know, I got some more stuff on top of the other stuff. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, like, returning I, back. Right, exactly. <laughs> I can't even see, you know. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's, and there's it's even something to be said about that, you know, because seeking, knowing that being in therapy is good for you is one thing, but doing that work, which is sometimes hard to do, to find a therapist. Sometimes a therapist doesn't work out. Um, you don't see results right away. It's therapy is something that you have to work at, and I think. Oftentimes, sometimes people have this misconception that they're going to feel better after they go for their first session. <laughs> no, it takes work. It's like going to the gym. It's yeah. the same thing for your brain. You have to work your exactly. brain. And over time, yes. you will start to see those things happen and unfold for you. And yes. um, I know I had I had a really great Black. He was Black. Same gender loving. Um, he lived here in Philadelphia. And mm -hmm. so we related on so many different levels and intersections. And his office just decided to let him go. And so mm -hmm. one day 
my therapist was just up and gone. All the things, we have been working mm -hmm. on things. We had things planned for the future and it just abruptly right. stopped and it was pulled from under me. I haven't seek therapy since because oh I'm a little traumatized by that situation. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, I'm a person, I'm not just a file. You know, that you can just, you know, toss to the side and, you know, mm -hmm. give me a new therapist and I pick up where I left off. No, that's yeah, not yeah. how this, that's not how it works for me. Um, but I appreciate the years that I was in for two years and I, and I did learn a lot. You know what? Um, Tony would know better, but I would say that's in a patient abandonment. Yeah. Sounds like a case. That's exactly what it is. Sounds like a case. Yes. Are, you bed? are you serious? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that could either been taken. That could be either be taken up with the physician himself or the the, the company that let him go mm -hmm. because they were the well. Let's put let's, let's put it on the company for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. But they were responsible for finding you another therapist. Or helping you mm -hmm. to find another therapist. They were supposed to be on that phone calling you. If they you did walk. call me. Yeah. And he did, he did one. offer to take over my case and I declined. Okay. Oh, wow. That's a little different. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's bring it up to speed. Even as a young woman, mm -hmm. a little child, you were always business savvy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You are very business savvy. You talked about, you know, your love of trigonometry and math and everything. Me and too. Trigonometry and algebra were my favorite. Yes. <laughs> love it. So I want to know about that business savvy, Ew. even as a young person. Like, what did that look like for you? Talk about the shows that you guys did as a young person. Yes, these shows. Were they in the backyard? They were in my backyard making my mother crazy. <laughs> <laughs> We were dancing all over her grass, knocking on her flowers. Woo, baby. That was something else. But yeah, we, yeah. The Sunshine Girls, I had, you know, I definitely, it just, just came out of my head. You know, like, so we so, we are so, we so are who we are. And then we got to, then we got to go and change it because society says this is what we should be doing or our parents yeah. say this is what we should be doing. It's so unfortunate, which is why in my coaching, I, I'm taking you back to the, I want to know what it was that you loved when you were little. That's right. Let that's me, let's, right. let's, that's where your passions lie. So we're going to talk about that, not to a psychotherapy, um, therapist level, but we're going to go there, you know, exactly. So we, so we can understand what is it that you love? Because what you do is not necessarily what you love, which is why I wanted to make a point of my bio and me embodying what I mm. do. Now. Yes. You know bio. what? about the whole notion driving your mother crazy. And this is where we start to get into the meat of this conversation, the vulnerability of it all. Talk about trauma with any individual that you encounter. A lot of trauma involves not having a secure attachment with our parents. Say that again. A lot of trauma revolves around not having a secure attachment to our parents. Mm. So in the show, you had stated before that, you know, you was always seeking the approval mm. of your mother. You mm. always wanted to make her shine, make yourself shine for her, seeking her approval. I want to even talk about your specific relationship yeah, with your you mother, even time, as a child. One time yeah. you said, uh, if you could just get from her, good job. Just one time. Yeah, it would have made a big difference, I think, you know, I definitely, oh, all right, work with me, because we almost jump around and we'll go back, but I was a, I was a great mommy, I was a great mommy, I was there for my sons every single, every day of their lives, you know, there wasn't a day that went by, I wasn't there, and, um, and I left my youngest sons uh, my I left my ex-husband when my youngest son was three months old so that's a long time of single parenting and that's a long time of raising two young black boys to become men mm -hmm. with, without incident 
you know that that's yes. that's that speaks volumes and um that speaks does. volumes not just for me but it speaks volumes for the company that i that um that i allowed them to keep when they were younger uh, but you know, then they went. Then they, they, you know, they find kids find their way. You know, they they mm -hmm. find their way. And both of my sons have their own story, so I don't want to speak too much about their story. But um, but as oh far wait, as quickly I, before you go into your relationship with your sons, I'm gonna let about the relationship between you and your mother. Yes, yeah, I'm, I, I was about to segue, but um, yes, me and my mom. So I wanted, I wanted because I was a single mom. I think especially. Um, I was looking for that approval. I didn't have it. To, it wasn't. It wasn't being reinforced by their fathers. You know mm -hmm. what I mean. You mm -hmm. know. Um, I think when you have two parents, you need to. You need dual approval, because of course my dad, you know, approved and and um, and supported me as you know as much as he could as far as you know telling me just things. You know you. You all, he's a cookie. You're going to live and die with bills. The best thing you can do is create memories for those boys, you know, and stuff like that is like th those things, those things impacted my life on it, you know, on, 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 on the next level to the next level. And, um, but I didn't get any of that kind of support from my mother. It was always, mm. it was always almost as if she was continuing to mother. And I was a mother. And so I think in that space, Ooh. women women just bump heads. Mm. They either they either become this or they become this. You know, I don't know. Yeah. I don't really know of too many relationships that are just right down the middle of the road. Cookie, when you say she continued to act as a mother, and, and I feel like that is what created that that rift in your relationship. Talk about that a little. What do you mean when she when you say she continued to act as a mom? What do you mean? Well, that's not what created the the, the divide between us. We'll go back to um to another area, but for that purpose, she she was still trying to be a mother to me and a mother to my kids. Mm -hmm. and my kids didn't need a mother; they already had one. But you wanted her to be grandma. Be grandma. Fortunately, you know how many, how many, how many of us are not given the opportunity to be grandma because our kids are incarcerated or our kids are on drugs or our kids just don't care. Exactly. You have an opportunity to be a grandmother. Be that. Just be that. That's all my kids need. And that's all I need you to be is that. And and now I want to just if I can just tap in yeah. because that's a that's a space that I had to deal with with my with my son and and his son. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, because when I came home, you know, when I left, my grandson was eighteen months, two years old, eighteen months, and so um, there was not a lot of mothering. And and my my grandson, praise God, has both both of his parents are the best are the best like they are great and um so they so so they never needed me i was living in california they were in new york city so i didn't you know my grandson and my um daughter-in-law they were with me for a little while in california because she wanted to move to california and he did not <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so she managed to stay out in california with me for like i don't know maybe about six months or so and then he was like okay so when you're coming back home <laughs> that. But yeah. uh, and we were going through changes then, and so in, in long story short, when I come home, my grandson is now ten, and um, I'm hearing my mother coming out of my mouth, mm. and, and I'm like, oh, rewind. And not only did I say rewind, but my son said, "Mom, we got this. <laughs> we don't. That's we got this. You grandma." And I was like, "Oh, okay." So I'm figuring out how to do this and I got it now, that's for sure. <laughs> right, right. It's it's hard. It's hard. It's very hard. It's it's hard. It's hard being a mother and having to cut that cord because you not only have to cut the cord with your child, you have to cut the cord with your grandchild and, and draw. I have to respect what my son and his wife decide for their son. Period. Absolutely. Did you not feel like your mom respected that in your own relationship? Absolutely did not. 
absolutely did not. That was a problem. That was a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know. Oh, um, <laughs> I, I, there's so many places to go from here. Even, okay, so we got, we got childhood, we got foundation. Um, for the people who did not watch, who did not, who do, who do not know your journey about the beyond the bars, mm. I'll, give us the cliff note versions on what happened and that 2012 sentence, 2012? 2012. 2012. That 2012 sentencing. Give us the cliff notes version. How you got there? Like what happened? You had an empire. You you were really a you you, you had were a, a, an, an empire yeah. yeah. Eric, remind me. You know, she said she want that that dynasty of the show. You said she, you know, she, what did oh, you yeah, say? Oh yeah, dynasty she, was your inspiration, right? Growing up, back you saw the diamonds. You saw, and I think it was I Diane saw Carol. Diane. Yes. 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 <laughs> Let me tell you something about Diane Carroll. That's tell cool. us, Cookie. Yes. That is miss me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that was my you know my mom you know she did whatever she did you know outside of our differences she was still a great mother doing what she felt like was she was just being mom you know what I mean um but I Diane Carroll in her in her Dominique Devereaux splendor of a yes. character that's what I aspired to be that's what I aspire to be like. And if you will, Nancy Wilson-ish also. You yeah, know, yeah. Mm -hmm. they just they just embody, you know, um, I don't know, that woman. Yeah. Yes, every woman and, and just a diva and just gorgeous and, and classic and timeless. Mm. Yeah. Timeless. Timeless. So yes, let's get into for the folks that have not seen your BET Trap Queens episode. Let us know what what happened. Cook? What what happened? I, I gotta tell you, I was watching it. You had me crying at some points and laughing at other times. You said something about they signed off on this shit. <laughs> you really so give us yeah. give us like like Tony said, give us the cliff notes. What happened, Cook? Okay, first of all, it's season three, episode seven. Tune in. Tune in, y'all. Yes. Um, yes. And, and, I, and I especially, I know I'm laughing and I'm joking and stuff, and uh, I have come through, but it, it, my intention and my decision to do that was inspirational. You know, that was my desire that, um, that someone that someone could hear it. Same reason why I do my podcast today. So that somebody can hear and maybe be in that space mentally where they're just about to go there and do that same mm -hmm. dumb thing I did. And it's like, whoa, I'm glad I watched that. You know what I mean? So that's that's yeah. the per that's that's what I want for that um for for, for that show. And um so where I was, you know, I'll make the, the long story short. So I went from loan officer to uh, real estate sales, which was absolutely boring to me. And um, I'm a number, I'm a numbers person, right? So I I can't, savvy. here we go. <laughs> you know, I can't do the, the paint chipping. Can they take off a hundred dollars from a five, from a $500,000 house? We're not doing it. <laughs> that. that doesn't yeah, work yeah. any extra money if you can't afford it don't buy it you know um and i mean that because a lot of people are told buy a house that you will grow into and now buy something you can afford so you can enjoy it yeah that's, that's what you need to do not buy something that you will grow into you're going to be miserable for the first 10 years of your life it's crazy when you yeah. might even, I mean, you know, as the world turns, we're not promised 10 years of life after that we purchase true. a home, right? right. So, um, so that being said, so I went from, I went from the loan officer to the real estate sales to, I had to find my place. I had to find what did it for me because I was fascinated by real estate. I did love um, purchasing property and, um, but what did it for me were the numbers again. 
you know, and, and that's how I ended up in real estate investment sales. Yeah. Um, and then there was incentive in the, you know, they want to call it kickbacks. You can call it what you want. Now I paid the cost. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so the, there was incentive in the deals. So when, when, when my deals were, uh, when my transactions were completed, everybody was happy. Everybody right. walked away smiling. Everybody had, um, either their incentive or kickback in their pocket right. mm -hmm. um, and and commissions were paid you know and so and and everybody just moved about you know so right here i i we talked a little bit about the series the trap mm -hmm. bet trap queens and it really kind of glorified the 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 trap queen part yeah the crime the life of crime but what i appreciated cookie doing right here is talking about how business savvy she had to be. Oh, absolutely. You had to know the market. You had to understand numbers. You had to understand finances. You had to have connections in the industry in order to get things done. At the end of the day, everybody was walking away with a smile on their face because everyone got paid. Mm -hmm. Cookie ultimately paid the, the, the big price. price, but at the end of the day, everyone walked away and got something. And I just, and I, I appreciated her talking about the professionalism the aspects of motherhood that helped her become mm -hmm. like for her to become a millionaire, she had to be she had to be on top of her game and know her shit. At her highest, she said eighteen million. Yes, that's what she got with the empire that she built. Yeah, Ooh. big money. Big money. Big money. Big money. Big money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Cookie. Okay from that place and that's how i find found myself in in that now when you put those deals together from the beginning from like from scratch it's a lot of work you know you have to really you have to read the title you have to know the location you need to know the market you need to know what what that market the height of that market is and what it will be in three to six months because that's how fast um the properties wow. were appreciating at the time wow. Goodness. And so, yeah. And so my clients had gotten to a point, they were, they were refinancing every six months. And I'm like, whoa, I said, okay, but you know what, at this point, you're going to need to refinance because this is going to be the last time because the, the market is about to change. So I would suggest since you are already at the hilt, go ahead and, 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 um, and refinance out and, 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 and invest in other ways, you know? Yeah. Um, so Long story short, that was great. So I was I was a help to the, I was a, you know was a, a plus to the people that that uh, didn't know a lot about real estate, wanted to be an investor, but then I was introduced to someone that was doing some real shady business, and I was like, oh, what you doing? <laughs> okay. Just, and just like I said on the show. Like I had no idea. I, I, you know, I just didn't think like that. That's not, you know, that's just not my thing. That 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 yeah. left turn, that left turning lane was not was not my lane. That's not the lane I lived by or grew up on or anything. Right, right. But when I saw it done, and the connections that this woman had at these banks with the banks calling her, you know, from their cell phone, it was just mind blowing. Ooh, I was like, yes. okay, you know what, wait a second now. Um, I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty because, you know, we know God doesn't tempt us, right? But the devil will tempt you. And so yeah, I'm, clear, yeah. I'm clear on that now. But at the time I'm thinking, well, shoot, this maybe, maybe this is my, now I was already high six figures. I was even beyond that. But she, yeah, because this was when after, yeah, this was after that. So I was already up there, but when she came into play and it was so, the way she had everything all set up, clockwork. it was it was clockwork. I was like, okay, maybe this is, you know, when, you, when you're when you a businesswoman, you got to take risks, right? And so I'm like, this might be the risk I'm supposed to take. So yeah. let me go for it. You know, and little did I know it wasn't the risk that I was supposed to take because again, God doesn't tempt us, right? Mm. That's that's hindsight. But it it was almost like a no lose situation. It it was like a no lose situation, in my opinion. And so I went there. 
So for your thought process, um, was it still like I'm helping the people who need to get into these houses? Was it was that the thing like I am literally? Well, that wasn't process? just helping me. <laughs> exactly. Because yeah, everybody was walking away with a like smile said, on their face. Like I said, everybody got paid. <laughs> so listen, they got their house. But, they got the kickback. Exactly. Right, and 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 the tables could easily have been turned because I could have turned them very easily. But that's not what I do. That's not who I am. And not for nothing else, I I was afraid that it would affect my son and them sentencing and all of that kind of thing. And I said, you know what? At the end of the day, no matter what, no matter who did what, I know what I did and I know it was wrong. You know, so. Um, so in this part right here, she's talking about the aspect of financial freedom. And when I had asked her that question, is it the financial freedom or our wants? as a culture, a black culture, asking for financial freedom, is it the decisions we make to gain financial freedom? And she got me all the way together. She <laughs> said, no, 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 no. It ain't our decisions that get us into these aspects that deal with financial freedoms. It's our lack of knowledge to do with finances. Yeah. It's the lack of knowledge with our finances, poor financial literacy. Yeah. And so, so she said, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I made bad decisions, but if we were more financially literate, Maybe we wouldn't have been here. Absolutely. We chased the bag so much. But it ain't about chase. It, it's about the knowledge you gain from that experience. Yeah. It's so much that we don't get to see. I mean, I'm sorry. It's so much that we don't get to obtain or have access to, um, especially when it comes to luxury, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to um, generational wealth. And I think um, for a lot of us, what that looked like mm -hmm. was money, jobs, houses, cars. And I think the it's starting to shift. Um, and we're starting to, it's, it's, it's about the perspective that you exactly. have. Exactly. And so I appreciated that because, you know, even thinking of like personally, I was like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't get a lot of financial stability leaving home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I knew how to pay bills, but I didn't know how to save money. No one taught me about investment. No one taught me about mm -hmm. how to avoid credit cards and stuff like that. And it's like, I just went out into the world and did what I wanted to do or, and or what I thought was best for me. And mm -hmm. I had to learn the hard way like a lot of us had to. Yeah. So I, I totally resonate with what she said, that, that financial literacy. And when we get those gems, we need to pass that down, Absolutely. share that with the community. All right. Yeah. What about this idea of financial freedom? And so you've, you've always wanted was a person, you know, to by be financially free and you were at the pinnacle even before all of that you were you're making really good money this idea even us as african-american people in our culture financial freedom wanting do you feel like wanting financial freedom especially in your position has led us into dangerous positions our choices the decisions that we make is is that the thing no our lack of knowledge on mm. what on what financial freedom is, mm. is our thing. Talk that's, to yes. that's, that's what we miss. So we think that financial freedom affords you German cars, but financial freedom doesn't afford you German cars. Financial freedom is living within your means. That's financial freedom. Mm -hmm. When you walk within your means, my Lord, I had chills. We have these credit cards. You max out your credit cards and then you don't have a job to pay these credit cards. When you start to buy things, now every once in a while we want to treat ourselves to something we probably can't afford and okay, but that cannot be a lifestyle. You cannot live your life on credit because yeah. credit has to be paid. Right? Yeah. Now, with interest. With, yeah. it, with ridiculous interest. Yeah. And um, so therefore, yeah, no, it's the lack of, it's the lack of knowing what financial freedom is. I'm yeah. really glad you asked that question, Tony, because I want to get great back. Question. It was a great question. What was it like for you? You really lived a life that most people can only dream of. <laughs> Um, just a lap of luxury and traveling. At one point, it says it's about 18 million. You, oh, you quote numbers. Yes. Come on, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? What? 
you really were out here really it, i mean business savvy is an understatement yeah. And I think a lot of people can probably look at it and say, oh, well, sorry, Philly is on fire tonight. Um, <laughs> every other night. Um, <laughs> but I think a lot of people can maybe easily judge someone's story like Absolutely. yours. But at the end of the day, you were a single mother of two young Black men that you yeah. were raising. You had skills. You had worked at American Express for a long time. Mm -hmm. You worked in the record label industry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you were really out here. You didn't okay. leave. You you took your babies with you to LA. That's right. To become a superstar. You know, I wanted you to, wanted to become a superstar. Right. You, you were an actress. actor. That's you right. were doing shows. I mean, so much. And I and I that's why I just I became overwhelmed. I was like, wow, the the woman, the story, is just amazing to me. And I don't judge you, not for your past, not for your present. I I think you you like you said they signed off on this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you that, but no, honestly, the reason why that took me out the way that it did is because none of the banks, none of these white, none of none of the big wigs, fat cats were held responsible no. for anything. No, it was so easy for them to throw the quote unquote little man under the bus. Easy. Very easily, very easily. In fact, I was told to, to not bring any bank conversation into the courtroom. What did they mean? Just what they said. So don't come in there trying to blame anything on the banks or, oh, you know, or even expose. Or even expose. So therefore, that meant I couldn't even expose anything well, that. Who said that? The bankers. They told Cookie off the top, like, girl, don't don't come in here talking about the banks did or anything like that. They wanted to make sure they, they put it all on you. Yeah. Wow. And it brought a tear to my eye, too, when they gave your son a year and a half, because I thought to myself, they didn't have to do that. That that was just them trying to dig the knife a little bit deeper. Yeah, because he's a young Black man with no priors, no brush with the law, you know, so that right there, oh man, that was, that was, that was, I had the, the first two years of incarceration was really tough for me, because um, I wasn't all right, and still wasn't, but you know, uh, until he came, came home, you know, actually went back home, and um, it took a toll on, on everybody. It just took a toll on everybody. And you know, my thing, my thing, you know, I, I take responsibility. That's why I sit here and say what was right, what was wrong as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, it does not mean that I don't have questions like, okay, well, when 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 are they gonna take responsibility for what was It wasn't done? about that, yeah. It was about the you little man. It was about getting the big fish and they right? reeled you in. Right. They used they your always son with it. As, a, mm -hmm. as a measure to, to reel you in. Yeah, definitely. That, Defin and they knew the kind of way, because they didn't even have, I had to tell them all of this for it to stick, you know, because they didn't have it on me. They just didn't. And, um, but you know, you can't just plead guilty without, you got to yeah, have a reason exactly. for your guilt, right? So, so they, but they didn't have that. That's not what they had. They didn't have any of that. So they didn't have a case on you, Cookie. Mm -mm. They used your son mm -mm. to bait you in, mm -hmm. and you pled guilty because you you wanted to save your son. Absolutely, because he didn't do anything. He didn't do anything. That was he had no responsibility in that. Absolutely, absolutely. He had no responsibility in that. I know this may seem like a touchy thing, and I, I just want you just to give us give me a little grace with this question. It, he didn't do anything but the consequences of your actions and decisions. Oof, oof, I'm getting emotional. Oh my God. The consequences and it, it had him in an uncompromising position yep. that hurt him, had nothing to do with him. And that's what the whole conversation is about today. The relationship with our parents, the mm -hmm. relationships we forge our decisions, mm. our choices. How do we move forward from those type of decisions, from those type of choices? 
Do we have thriving relationships after this? What does that look like? Your son was, was he, he, he was signed the, he, he, you know, mommy said sign. You know what I mean? Oh, talk about devastating. That was, that was incredible. Um, and can I say this to you, Cookie? Yes. I probably would have signed too. Because if my mama told me to sign, mm -hmm. if my mama was a real estate superstar, if I saw my mama doing this day in and day out, getting everybody else a house, if my mama told me, baby, I got you, just do it, just sign right here, I'm gonna get you this house. And you know, let me let me speak to that, that whole thing. It wasn't just sign these documents, they're fake. It wasn't any of that. It was, you know, back in the days, y'all, I don't know, y'all a little younger than me, maybe, I don't know. But you know, back in the days when you would, you would, um, you would lie about your address so that you can get your child in a specific school, school district, yes. right? Okay. And so, and then also, um, I didn't do this, but many parents, especially in, in our, in our, in, in, you know, in our, in our hoods, right. You know, um, want a phone, they ran the phone bill up, can't pay the phone bill. So they put the phone yeah, in the child's name. name. Right. Absolutely. And so I will be, I'm going to keep it. Wanna, this is where my head was yeah. when that when I when 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 I allowed that to happen, that was where my head was. There was no way, there was no way I would ever put my child in harm's way. Ever, if I ever thought. Now, yes, yes, the application says prosecution. Da da da. Who reads that? I didn't. I'm a smart girl. I didn't read it. And even if, let's say if I did, I, I didn't know what, I, prison? Yeah. Honestly, when I allowed that to happen, I thought the worst thing that could happen was they stripped me of all of everything that I had built. And I would have to start all over again. I never thought prison. I would never ever put my child in a space where I thought prison could happen to his life, yeah. ever. Ever, ever, ever. I felt when that. you did your time, mm, your relationship with him, how is that? Was because of that? Is, was that a separate relationship? Oh yeah, it 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 definitely. Um, I'm gonna tell you what severed the relationship. It wasn't. It wasn't what happened at the time. It was prison that severed the relationship. Mm. Mm. It, it was being away from my sons for that amount of time that severed that relationship. That's what severed it. Because in federal prison, you speak on the phone for 15 minutes at a time. That's it. So after 15 minutes, you have to wait a whole half an hour. To, to make yet another phone call. And so, but in that half an hour, you gotta let other people use the phone. So you may not get back to that phone for another oh, hour or two hours. And that conversation, while I'm still there, they're gone, they're living, they're doing life outside. You know, they're like, why are you bringing this up? We already talked, well, no, we didn't finish, but, but, but wait. You know, mm -hmm. and so you never, as a mother or a parent incarcerated, get to get to console your kids again until you come home. Not only that, my kids were grown, so we had conversations that needed to happen, like the conversation that I can now have. I didn't want to speak that conversation on the phone. Yeah. You know, I couldn't speak the conversation on the phone and let them hear what I'm telling my my, my sons, you know, Absolutely. And, and telling them all of what happened. I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, 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 so you have this distance, you have the divide, you don't even have mommy in your ear. It's just, it's just now she's serving the time. I served the time. Maybe he felt like he was sacrificed you know, and, and I had no way to say, no, you weren't. Listen to what happened. Listen to what I, listen to the process that I was, that I was, that I, um, listen to my thought process 
in, in what I was doing and why I did what I did. I had no idea it would result in prison for you. I had no, I had no idea you would even be called to the table. For what? Right. You know, you were on vacation. Yeah, I'm you were out and you came back right back to the country. Let me ask you this, Cookie. Do you think the fans were watching you when you had left the country? They were saying, we're going to let her enjoy herself. And as soon as she comes back, I mean, I'm just saying as someone who's, I'm watching the story. Yeah. And I said to myself, wow, they really wanted to hurt this Black woman. Mm -hmm. They yeah. waited. They watched and they waited. And waited. And then used your son as bait on that to get you on that stand. Yeah, yeah. And you know what's the craziest part is I think they thought that they were going to um oof, yeah, they definitely waited. You know, uh, they arrested him the day before I came before my flight arrived back in in, in um in the states. So they, and my daughter in law, she said she called me, she couldn't get me the phone went straight to voicemail. I was flying. It's an eleven hour yeah. flight. Yeah. You know, and so long story short. I do believe, in addition to what you said, um, Eric, I believe also that uh, they didn't think he was going to make bail without me being home. Mm -hmm. So they thought that they was going to have this young man in the system. She's going to come home and her, her son is going to be in the system. And um, <clears throat> so, no, uh, but bail was made, you know, and... Um, without me being there. <laughs> and mama did what mama had to do. Um, let's talk about, tell me if you don't mind, I, I know we're yeah, coming close to the end. You know, I wanna talk about you as a, a black woman, a mother, and you touched on it a little bit already. Um, inside the life, doing time, and then that, that transition coming out, I wanna talk about that because you have yes. devoted your life to helping other women who walked in similar shoes, walked a similar path that you did. So talk to us about life on the inside, and then we're going to transition out and talk about your nonprofit. Okay. Well, oof. life on the inside was devastating, traumatizing. Um, and that was, in, that was at first. I'm just going to say that was at first. And as you go in, and I and I actually, you know, I journaled. I journaled my time from the day that I walked in. Wow! All the way, all the way up until so that, that. Is that a book? Can I go I get that at Barnes and Noble? <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> Wait, you documented from day one, Cookie? Yeah, yeah. As soon as this, as soon, they're working on six series, uh, uh, um, a series for me, a six six season series for me right now so as soon as that is all oh, you know supporting yeah, i'm yes. gonna yeah i'm gonna release that but what i did do at, at 2000, 2017 i had my daughter and law manage my facebook page and so i released um the first year of those journal entries oh my god y'all wouldn't even know me <laughs> Yeah, nobody could even believe that was me talking. Like, and why is that, Cookie? Because it was raw emotion. I really yeah. raw emotion. You know, I'm 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 pretty much I'm self-contained as it as it is for the most part. And um I'm poised as my dad would want me to be. You know, so I don't just go around talking like no, 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 no. you know what I mean? But <laughs> those journal entries, <laughs> yeah, I just let it go. I mean, they're my journal entries, right? That's, that's right. Where you were at that time. That's yeah, right. That's right. And um, and so they were filled with things that I saw going on in there, things that the way I felt about what I saw. Um, why am I here with these people? for real like really and yeah and yeah. yeah yeah with these people like why this is crazy and then you know as time moved on and as I was building my relationship with God mm -hmm. he showed me that you could have been one of those people that you squinching up about you could easily have been one of those people because it's not always about you know 
what your parents did when they raised you. It's not all about the, the poise my dad taught me to have and my mother showed me what it looked like. It's, it's once, you, once you enter a, a, a space in life, you start to make your own decisions. And your, your, your own decisions don't always lead you to the place that represents what your parents instilled in you, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You make mistakes, you fall victim to things. Drugs was just not my thing. This was not a right. thing for me, but it doesn't mean that it could not have been a thing for me. The devil just yeah. didn't put that in the space. God didn't allow it. That, no, you know, because we, we know the story of Job, right? And God allowed yeah. these things to happen. Go things ahead, happen. take it. Go ahead and take it. I'll let you do da da da, da. Not, not I'll let you do whatever, but um, but he allowed the devil to do whatever happened, right? And so I'm saying that to say, he chose me for his purpose. For his purpose, we run around here looking for our purpose. Okay, well, we got flesh, right? We got to satisfy the flesh. So we need to seek out and find our purpose. I get it. But, but, but all he needs for us to do, and your creator, your universe, God for me, Allah, um, all he needs for us to do is worship him. And that's it. So for his purpose, drugs was not for me. Exactly. That's it. And that's all. There's no spectacular cookie doesn't do drugs. She's this, she's that. No, 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 no. No, no, no. We must not get beyond ourselves. And we must not forget that yeah. it is but God in his grace yes. that we are where we are. That's it. That's yeah. it. Not genius. <laughs> your your impact and, and the lives that you touched inside. And you know, ultimately, the lives that you're touching right now on the outside. And that's why you you built you know this foundation. You built this found you know this nonprofit. You know, woman on site. You know, and I think we need, we want to hear you speak to that um, as far as your work and why it's so pivotal. Pivotal. I think you had to go what you had to go through in order to be this version of yourself. You yes. had to go through what you had to go through. <laughs> in order to be this version of yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm getting chills again. In order <laughs> to help be an impact and ultimately transform the lives of women. And ultimately it, was transform that. it was necessary that I walked that journey, that path, as others did. Because I can articulate what it was. But many that walk that path can't. Come on. Yeah. Mm. So I can talk about it. And so I just finished my program, uh, my workshop. Well, it's a workshop and it's a program. You know, my program is, 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 is multi-layered. Uh, it includes my psychotherapist and it includes um, my psychologist. Yeah, my psychotherapist and um, my nutritionist and myself yeah. as a life coach. And so that's my program, but my, and, and that's completed at this point. And, um, and I just finished my workshop, completed that. I just, I actually just finished that and I've been working on that forever, but you know, the podcast and everything else takes, it just it kept getting in the way, kept getting in the way, but I finished the, the, um, the re-entry workshop that is completed but of course you know what is re-entry without the spirit of entrepreneurship right understanding yeah. understanding credit and understanding your power to create your life the way you want it to be Ooh, i love that is so empowering and just so <laughs> uplifting and wow oh, and so what's it what's what has it been like for you to work with these women who are transitioning they're coming from the inside back out to the outside. Um, what, what has that been like for you? What has that journey been like for you? It has been, <clears throat> it is what made me realize that I had some generational trauma myself. Yeah. So I didn't carry this. I mean, you know, I didn't know this before entering prison. I kind of didn't, I didn't really know it while I was in prison. It was really only when I started helping these women 
post-incarceration that I realized that, oh my gosh, I had some generational trauma of myself. Exactly. Like, untreated, but like, I didn't even realize because you know, mommy and daddy, that was my mom and that was my dad. And what they said was right. And, and God bless all of our parents, right? But our parents are not perfect. None yeah. of them. None of them. No. Right. I, oh, come on. Our parents are not perfect. Right. They did the best that they had, and they had what they had to do with the best they had. Like, we, uh, sometimes we, we blame our parents in situations. We hold yeah. resentments. We hold unforgiveness in our hearts. You know, but they did the best with what they had. That's it. Yeah. That's it. That's all anybody can do. Just do your best. Just do your best. I know I personally struggle with my relationship with my mother who, um, mm -hmm. because of addiction, she wasn't in my life and we really didn't, uh, we didn't really start talking until I was 30. And so it's been, a, it's been a struggle. So I want to ask you, what advice would you give to any children out there that may be struggling with their relationship with a parent because their parent was away or maybe that parent mm -hmm had struggled with addiction, so they weren't in their lives. What advice would you give to those that are listening and watching? Okay, take a well, beat. Take a ahead, beat first ahead. before you answer that question. Just take a beat. Take a breath. Because that was, that was a really good question. Mm -hmm. It and is a really good question. And I will take a beat. I will take a beat. I will take a beat. And I'll, the beat is followed by the same thing I was going to say which is don't give up on your parents. You know, um, what I've learned about addiction from a distance is that while you, Eric, you, Tony, myself, we can make our decisions. We have the willpower to go forth and conquer our storms and come through, not conquer our storms, but come through our storms, right? Mm -hmm. But everybody is not equipped with what it takes to come through. Now, when they get ready to come through, you know, they might reach for the hand and they may not. But if you're there and they can still hold on to that hand, they're going to come up. They'll come up. They'll come up. Because the love doesn't change because, because they're addicted. You know what I mean? It just doesn't. It doesn't change. It doesn't change. We must not, and, and I don't know your situation with your mom or what you've experienced, but what I know about the, the people that I've worked with, you must remember that it's the love that binds us and it's the love that gets us through. Because when I yeah. say that God brought me through my storm, I mean that. And if God is love, and if love is what you have for your mom that wasn't there for you, then that's what's gotta get her through. Whew. Thank you, Cookie. <laughs> what, what more is there to say than after this powerful interview? And, and that's why I wanted to hear your truth. And somebody else needs to hear your story. I don't, it, it, it's tons of people who probably didn't watch that season three, episode seven. It is tons of people, but this experience, somebody needed to hear your story. Somebody needed to hear your journey and know that there is hope on the other side. Mm -hmm. You know, what I've been through does not dictate who I am mm -hmm. as a person. I don't believe there's anything in life that needs to be thrown away. Everything in life is a teachable moment. Everything in life is a teachable mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. I just, I feel like I'm honored to be in the presence of you, to have learned more about you um, and to learn more about your story that I did not initially know. And I think somebody's life is going to be changed by even watching this episode. Yes. yes. Wow. I do. Eric, do you have anything last <laughs> words you want to say? I do, I do, I do. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that um, that I appreciate you guys for even inviting me to this platform to speak. I haven't done a lot of these. Of course, I want to do more, and mm -hmm. I will. Um, I will do what I have to do to do more, you know, and seek them out. But um, this was an opportunity 
to, 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 I just feel like it was an opportunity for, for Eric, for that space for you. I don't know how you share in, in your circles, um, but I understand from your intro that you are a scholar. And so that doesn't leave a lot of room for a scholar to be tainted with such a past and a mom that's not perfect. So thank you. This was so special. This was so special for me <laughs> and I hope for you. And Tony, you just keep doing what you're doing because you, oh, you're you. great at what you do. Tony is, a, you. Uh, Tony is a, a, a psychotherapist extraordinaire, which is why I have him on my show every last Thursday of the month. I heard him speak a couple of times and I just, I didn't need any more after that. I knew, <laughs> <laughs> I knew, and you know, and sharing in the LGBTQIA community plus was, 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 was what people need to associate themselves with each other, you know? Yeah. Likenesses, that's all. So this was amazing. And, and I just want to say to the people listening, my, my, my takeaway is don't give up. Don't, don't give up, up on the people who may have had a past or maybe made some decisions or, you know, if your life was polarized and put on, I'm sure it'd be some decisions that you made that people would frown upon. Mm -hmm. Don't judge. Find, find that space and that love in your heart for forgiveness because once you find that space, if you can, I think it will lighten that burden a little bit and you'll feel a little bit better. This was such a blessing for me to hear from a black woman, a mother. Mm. Uh, thank you for sharing in this space and being vulnerable and being real and being raw. We are going to be watching. We cannot wait for the series to come out about you because I, tell you, I told you in the beginning of this interview, I've become so fascinated with your story, the woman, the mother. Um, the Hunger Podcast is gonna stay in touch you are such a beautiful spirit. Thank you for sharing your light and taking, you know, an hour and a half out of your time to, to spend it with us. This, you know, there's certain conversations that you just never forget. It's certain mm -hmm. interactions when you meet someone, they say the, the, the first impression is the lasting impression. Yes. Yeah. This is one of those times. This is one of those moments that I'm not going to forget. So thank you, Cookie. Um, Where can we find you, Cookie? It's infectious. Your smile is infectious. Isn't Love you. it? Oh my God, isn't it? <laughs> you can find, find me at Lonette Williams, L O N E T T Williams. Uh, that's on Instagram, that's on uh, YouTube and Facebook. But you know, Facebook, I keep kind of tight, even though it's a public page. Uh, also at the Sisteration Room, which is on YouTube. It is, we're just building an IG for um, the Sisteration Room, but you will find the IG uh, at the Sisteration Room on, um, on IG. And we're up at Woman on Silence, but just to keep it simple, you go to Lonette Williams on IG, you'll find everything there. You'll find all the, 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 the access. <laughs> we got you, y'all. We'll drop Lonette's information, all her ads, everything. <laughs> right, all my ads, right? <laughs> in the episode notes, so that way y'all know where to find Cookie and support her. Awesome. Thank all right, you. this was a great experience. Thank you, Lana, for being here with us this evening. I just appreciate you guys. Thank you. Good night. Have a good night. <laughs> good night. <laughs> That was the Hunger Podcast Live with Miss Cookie. Thank you so much for being here. You could find us on YouTube. Subscribe. YouTube channel, Hunger Pod mm -hmm. Live. And again, my name is Eric Cole, Life Coach. And I am Tony Purnell. I'm your favorite psychotherapist right out here in Philly. Yes, dial in, y'all. Come on, dial in. Listen, remember, if you want to be a part of this experience email us at hungupod at gmail.com yes and also send your love your feedback your ratings reviews all that good stuff to hungupod at gmail.com until next time world peace, peace.